you know, we're the authors of our own lives and, and what do we want to write? Business of Architecture UK, episode 61. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week's interview comes as a result of a book that I recently listened to called The Gig Economy. And this book, I think, is an incredibly powerful book. And inside it, it contains a lot of eloquent and well-articulated, powerful strategies for navigating and designing a balanced, fulfilled, profitable life within contemporary society and our contemporary information economy. And I really think this book needs to be read by all architects because of the changing nature of the way that architects are wanting to work, the way that businesses should and can be working, and the sort of you know, the studies in effectiveness that independent working provides for so many different types of businesses and professions already. Um, so after I consumed this book at a rapid pace, I reached out to Diane and in via, I think it was via Twitter that we got chatting or I tweeted something in celebrating the book and Diane liked it and this is why I love Twitter. Um, and we got chatting and I invited her. I said, please, if, if you'd be able to come on to the podcast, that would be absolutely amazing just so I can ask you some more questions about the book and actually have you sort of navigate and explain a little bit about how this book came into being. So Diane herself is, she's a private equity advisor. She's the author of The Gig Economy. She's a Harvard Business Review and Forbes contributor. She's an adjunct uh, lecturer at Boston. She first created um, The Gig Economy as an MBA course um, which was heralded by Forbes as one of the most ten top ten most innovative business school courses in the country, um, and she's got an impressive CV herself. She's was studied um, psychology and economics at Harvard. She's been a public policy fellow at Trinity College in Dublin. She's been involved in all sorts of fascinating and incredible things. And to be able to sit down and just speak with her and have her articulate and eloquently go through the ideas that are contained in this book is a very, very powerful and I think very, very compelling argument for flexible and independent working, working that is focused on results and not on this culture of FaceTime that many of our businesses are so attached to. So sit back, relax and enjoy Diane Mulcahy. Special announcement here. We at the Business of Architecture UK love to help you win more great clients and projects. And we've got a really cool opportunity for you. Our affiliate colleagues over at the Architects Marketing Institute would like to offer you a very special 45 minute one on one breakthrough call with one of their senior marketing experts. Now, the Architects Marketing Institute, which was co-founded by my good friends, Eric Bobro, Richard Petrie, and also Enoch Sears was one of the original founding members. So these guys really are some of the world's leading marketeers for architects. So you're going to be in very, very good hands. And on this call, the Architects Marketing Institute, or AMI, will help you map out a simple action plan. And this is going to be based on their experience of working with hundreds of architects around the world where they've helped them increase their income and the quality of their projects. And it's going to be tailored to you, depending on your budget and your goals and, of course, your ability to be able to implement. So the Architects Marketing Institute, just like us at the Business of Architecture UK, absolutely adore and love helping architects and want to help you attract more and win better opportunities for your practice. So that is the one-on-one -on -one session with AMI, Architects Marketing Institute. It's a free session, but in order to be able to qualify to have one of these sessions, there are a few required criteria. And the first one of those is that you are the owner, partner, or main decision maker for an architecture practice or design-related business you must be able to have the ability to provide exceptional service and results for your clients. And finally, you must be targeting at least a further £100,000 in additional revenue for your practice. So if that sounds like you and you want to speak to one of the Architects Marketing Institute senior advisors, advisors jump on one of those breakthrough session phone calls, 
click on the link that's provided in the information and AMI will be very happy to speak with you. And then after your successes, you can come and tell me all about it on the Business of Architecture UK. Welcome. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Um, today, I am talking with Diane Mulcahy. Have I said that right? Mulcahy is the correct way to say it with an Irish or British accent. Mulcahy is how we say it in the US. Okay, so I'm, I'm allowed to say it the way I said it. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. So you've got a bit of a Irish Gaelic influence in you. Yes, yes. I'm an Irish citizen, actually. Fantastic. And you're a professor up at Boston, in Boston. Um, yep. I'm an adjunct lecturer at Babson College here in Boston, where I teach in the MBA program. Okay. And the and your book, The Gig Economy, came out, as I understand, of as a kind of course that you were preparing or writing or delivering on one of your MBA courses? Yeah, so I created uh, the first course in the US on the gig economy. I've been teaching it now for six years and the book really grew out of my teaching of that class. Right, okay. And when was it, when was it released? The book was released uh, in November of 2016 and you know, still has a lot of legs, much to the surprise of my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And I mean, for me, as I was, I was just saying, this is one of these books that I, I picked up, somebody had recommended it to me. Um, and it kind of managed to summarize so many thoughts and ideas that I'd been trying to articulate myself about this kind of transition that we're experiencing from the kind of, in, let's call it the industrialized form of economy, where we go and we have jobs and there's sort of stable income to what many of us are doing now, which is operating in a gig-like economy. And for architects and as a profession, we're seeing this more and more where, you know, young architectural practitioners, young professionals are breaking away from working in larger businesses and going out to set up on them by themselves. And also kind of combining this with lots of different types of freelance work and other ways of generating income. So and it was really fascinating to read in your book about how that this is, you know, this is actually something that's very deep. This is a deep cultural and economic shift that's happening. Um, can you say a little bit about, you know, what, how you began the book, how it, how it came into existence? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, you know, as somebody who had a traditional career as a full-time employee and a full-time job, I always felt like there must be another way of working that's more interesting than this, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I always envisioned uh, that the ideal way of working would be to have just an interesting portfolio of different things that you did, and also that it would be much more geographically agnostic than commuting into an office every day. Like it yeah. just, it never really worked for me, that model. And I think that one of the reasons that the gig economy has caught on, and by the way, just so that everybody's clear, when I talk about the gig economy, uh, you know, it doesn't just equal Uber drivers. What I'm talking about is anybody that's not working as a full-time employee in a traditional job. So you could be a consultant, an independent contractor, a freelancer, an architect, uh, yeah. somebody in a creative field. It's really very broad. Um, I think one of the reasons this way of working is catching on is that there are so many pain points with traditional work. It's, it's ripe for disruption. There's so many things that people don't like about the way that work is structured into a traditional job. And the gig economy represents an alternative way of working mm. that really resonates with a lot of people. And what, what would you say are those kind of pain points that are really making people sacrifice the stability of you know, regular income and going out into working as a, as a giga, if you like. Yeah, I want to come back to your characterization that it's a sacrifice of regular income. Yeah. Um, but, you know, here in the U.S., when you survey employees, the results are fairly dismal. Employees are 
uh, not engaged in their work. They don't believe it's meaningful. They're not challenged by it. They are unhappy. They are dissatisfied. They live these unhealthy lives where they have long commutes in a car to sit in a cubicle all day long in expensive real estate that costs the company a lot of money. And under, you know, employee underperformance is a persistent problem despite decades of management and HR theory about performance reviews. Hmm. When you survey independent workers, it's almost the exact opposite. They are engaged, they're satisfied, they're challenged, they believe their work has meaning. They are living healthy lifestyles where they're working either from home or in co-working spaces or in places that they love to be. They have time uh, and the ability to balance their professional and personal lives. Their stress levels are lower. They're healthier. They're not, you know, companies save a lot of money by not having to build offices around them. They don't waste time while they work. They're much more efficient. And companies don't have to deal with underperformance. If a contractor isn't working out, you simply don't renew their contract. So it solves a lot of problems that the traditional jobs economy creates. And that's not to say that the gig economy is the only answer. There are probably other ways of working that are going to emerge um, that will be equally as adept at solving some of these problems. But for right now, the gig economy represents a viable, attractive alternative that is mm. serving many people. And, and you, you said you were going to pick up on, on it being a sacrifice and challenging that. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the US, what I would say is that there is a widespread misperception that because you have a job, you have security. And I am here to be the messenger to tell you that there is no security in our economy. There is no job security. I mean, all you have to do is read the lay press, uh, the business pages, and see that there, you know, companies regularly, even growing, thriving companies, regularly conduct layoffs, downsizings mm. of departments or teams related to products or markets they're no longer pursuing. Companies get acquired, they go out of business, they move into different markets, they change their strategies. So in our dynamic economy, there's just no way that companies can offer the kind of job security that they used to. Um, and I think what, you know, what's really damaging is that employees end up in traditional jobs, they think that they're secure, and then that they act like that's not, you know, their job is, is theirs forever and it's not going to change. And that's where people end up getting surprised, laid off, and getting caught unawares. One of the things that really attracts people to independent work in the gig economy is the ability to create their own sense of security that is real. Yeah. Because they are controlling their career. They are controlling how much they work, with whom they work, when they work. And when you have multiple streams of income from different clients, that actually is real financial security. Because yes. even if you lose a contract or a gig with one client, your income doesn't go from 100 to zero, it goes from 100 to 80. So you have much more security than you do if you, if you kind of put all your eggs into one basket of a single employer. Yeah, and it, it's, it's very interesting for, for us in the architectural world, you know, the construction industry tends to be one of the most sensitive industries to any kind of economic downturns or it's very kind of delicate in that when it can be perceived to be like that um, and often you know the sort of trauma that happens with architects or people they've been working in practices for 10 15 20 years and then their jobs suddenly or abruptly come to an end or even you know graduating into a recession like i did in 2008 it was very difficult to even get a permanent position in an architecture practice and actually, I had, to, I had to learn to contract. And within that, actually, you started to find these other areas of freedom. And you started to be able to structure your career in a way that offered you a different type of lifestyle. And I think that's, it is, it's very, very exciting. And um, what would you say are the skills that people need to learn that aren't sort of formally taught in our traditional education in order to be successful in the gig economy? 
That's such a great and critical question um, because I have a lot of beef about the traditional education system because I do think it does, honestly, and I, I think it does a disservice to students because our universities and our business schools are really primarily preparing students to be full-time employees in yeah. full-time jobs. And that's simply not the way that most people are going to um, live the entirety of their professional life. I mean, in most cases, there will be some periods in which you work for yourself. So I think the key skills are skills related to running a, biz a small business, because when you work for yourself, you are a small business. And I also think just from my conversations with people that have transitioned from full-time employment to working independently, time management is a huge skill that nobody talks about. Mm. So when you go from being a full-time employee where somebody tells you, look, be in the office every day at, five, at nine and you can leave at five or six and come here Monday through Friday, you never develop the skills for figuring out how do I work best? When do I work best? How should I structure my day to take advantage of my periods where I concentrate and focus the most, where I have the greatest amount of attention? How do I need to build in you know, eating or exercising? Or when do I do individual work versus take meetings and calls? Like All of those things, when you start working independently, you have to figure out from scratch because you're so used to accommodating yourself to somebody else's time schedule. Yeah, and, and it's interesting as well, like it, at university, how you're kind of left to your own devices a lot of the time. Um, and you might not ever be formally taught those kind of structured skills of how to organize your time and how to be effective at time. In, in architectural education, one of the biggest complaints that uh, a lot of students have, or one of the kind of big concerns is mental health. Um, within within those types of environments due to the fact that architecture tends to be one of these disciplines where students will put in huge hours of time and it's, it, it's often you know rated as one of the longest amount of hours per week for any kind of course just to the nature of of when you're designing something drawing can take a lot of time there's lots of other things to be managing you know student um, architectural students end up then work, getting into unhealthy routines of maybe working uh, almost through the nights before deadlines and things like that and then that kind of practice ends up um, being put into practice or brought into the profession and you have this culture of late night working and you know there's no sort of there's no sort of um, relationship that's ever established between what makes you a productive and efficient worker. Like, what is the context for that? What is the, what's the environment that would be best for you to be in? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that there really is, even in traditional class universities, there is no mechanism for that. So, so how did you, how did your studies into the gig economy, how did this emerge for you and how do you operate? In, like personally? Well, so I walk the talk. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people who write and speak about the gig economy, interestingly, are full-time employees. I'm a, I always find that kind of fascinating when I go to conferences and all the speakers are, are full-time employees. Um, I've been working independently now for the past seven years. So I have a portfolio of work that I do. I write, obviously. Um, I consult, I speak, I teach, and I have a variety of different clients. I work um, primarily remotely. I have a home office uh, set up in my home. I live in Boston, so I live in a city. I think that's helpful in many ways for someone who works independently and doesn't have an office. Yeah. Um, just to have kind of an environment where it's easy to get out and to meet people, it's easy to make connections, it's easy to go to events whether it's networking events or social events. Um, but co-working spaces have really, I think, come up and filled a void for independent workers. It gives them a structure if they need it mm. and the ability to, to not feel isolated, you know, to not feel like you're sitting at home toiling away um, and, and, and nobody knows what you're doing. 
So that's my situation. I've, I've created kind of that, that work life and I'm geographically agnostic so I can be, um, you know, I'm, I spend a fair amount of time in Europe. I'm a European citizen. I also live in Boston. I spend a fair amount of time in New York. So it just allows me the freedom to structure my days and my uh, whereabouts how I want. Brilliant. And and how do you how would you encourage or how would you suggest for people wanting to make the transition into independent working? What do you think are the sort of the main uh, things to be considering? And is it and is it something that every that every kind of profession can adapt to? I do think it's something every kind of profession can adapt to. I think um, what I've seen here in the U.S. is that it has spread to every profession that I've seen. I suppose if I thought about it, maybe I could come up with one or two, but, um, but, I, but I do think it, it can be implemented no matter what kind of career or profession that you're in. It, in terms of getting started, I think there are a couple of tactical steps that um, allow people to start moving in the direction of independent work without taking a big leap. And I think it's important to emphasize that you don't need to take a huge leap. We're not talking about quit your job and, you know, go 100% into independent work. That's intimidating for people and it's risky. Mm. So the, the first thing I would say, step one, is to develop what I call an exit strategy for the situation, the job that you're in now. And the, I, I have that, this exercise in my book, and I teach it to my students. And the exercise is to imagine that you knew that you were going to be laid off in six months. And what would you do to prepare for that? And it's, you know, what I do for my students is I actually have them make a list. You know, what would you do professionally? What would you do financially? What would you do personally? Hmm. And then I have them get into groups and talk about it and exchange lists. So by the end of class, everybody has a really concrete tactical exit strategy with steps that they can start executing. And the reason that that's so powerful is that most people feel stuck in their jobs and they feel unprepared to make a move or unable. And what structuring an exit strategy does is it gives you control and power back. And it gives you a list of things that you can do. And every time you tick something off that list, it gives you a greater sense of control over your own destiny, a greater sense of preparation, and more confidence to be able to think about the next step. So creating an exit strategy is a really powerful first step. The second step, I think, is to get a side gig. Again, there's no reason to jump off a cliff here. Take, take baby steps and think about what is something that you would like to do independently for work. And is there a way that you can experiment with that on the side while you're currently still in your full-time job. And what that does is provide a really low risk, low cost way to gather a lot of information. You can figure out, is there a demand for this service that I'm interested in or product or whatever? Are people willing to pay for it? How much are they willing to pay for it? Does it seem like I can make a living at this? You know, it gives you a lot of information. Um, about whether it's viable for you mm. to get ready to work independently. So start something on the side. And then I think third, the third step is, um, you know, nobody does, nobody runs the business of themselves by themselves. Yeah. And thinking carefully about what are the things that you like to do and are good at doing? And what are the, what are the things that you don't like to do? Because when you go out and work on your own independently, there's a lot of support you need to run your own business. Maybe you need a virtual assistant or a social media person or somebody to help with marketing or somebody to help with putting together a sales pipeline or somebody to do your back office and invoicing and taxes. Like whatever it is that you don't like to do. Um, and how can you go out and ask people for references and referrals and how can you start building that team around you so that when you do go out, you can be successful. Mm. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, it kind of fascinates me that, 
that there isn't more of this in the preparation of our students in, in whatever disciplines. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I think that university, it, it is interesting because universities themselves are very active participants in the gig economy. I mean, they hire independent workers in the form of adjunct professors. They yep. have developed online and remote classes. People don't even have to be on campus anymore. You know, professors have had side gigs forever. Most professors have consulting practices or they write books or they do speaking gigs. So it is interesting that the gig economy is so much a part of the university model, but they don't actually teach it to their students. Mm. Um, and I think universities are really caught up in a very traditional way of thinking. Many of them are measured in terms of how many, you know, what percent of their students get jobs when they graduate? What, are the, what is the average salary? And so for the, in terms of like career services and funneling students into alternative career paths, it can possibly seem risky to the university to do that given traditional metrics about how their success is measured. Oh, wow. That's, that's fascinating, actually. I didn't realize, I hadn't considered that before, that that's actually one of the sort of performance metrics that universities use to you know, quantify their effectiveness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it, it's also partly like career services is staffed with people that, um, you know, have traditional jobs. I think part of it's just a mindset that this is what they've always done. There's a lot of inertia around that, I think, mm. too. And it's interesting how you're discussing, you know, you're, you're talking about a, a, a strategic transition as opposed to a kind of, you know, I know a lot of people that start their businesses or in architecture, for example, sometimes it's a layoff or, you know, it's a, it's an extreme dishappiness with the, with the, with the employer or the job and they kind of just immediately leave and then find themselves into all sorts of problems, but actually a strategic strategy to move into this kind of independent mode of working is much more powerful. How, how do you think um, businesses you know, if you're an employer and you're running an organization, how could, how could business businesses benefit from making this transition to having independent workers and having, you know, what are the benefits there? There are so many benefits, even, even for businesses that bring on, you know, that even just bring on a small number of independent workers. It's not like you have to turn over your entire workforce to see the benefits, but for, you know, I think the best place to start for businesses is to think about what are the positions that you have persistent problems filling and every business that you talk to, you know, you go talk to the HR leader and say, what are the positions you always have open? Like you just can't seem to get enough people or get the right, get the right people. It's always a war for talent. And that's like, pick a pain point and start there. Mm. And one of the reasons that, working with independent workers can be so successful is that it allows you to open up beyond your geographic area. So if you have persistent problems filling position X, you can think about hiring a, an independent contractor to perform the, the, you know, to generate the deliverables and results of position X, and then that person can be anywhere. They can still spend some time on site, but they don't have to be located there. And you're casting a much wider net for accessing the skills and the experience and the expertise that you need to find. So I think that's a great way to start. And companies can really find the talent that they need when they need it if they're willing to expand their um, traditional search criteria and open it up to independent workers. The other benefit is that companies can staff up and staff down much more easily. So yeah. instead of bringing on full-time employees and then laying people off or downsizing or outsourcing, they can bring on contractors for a particular project, a product launch, a strategy initiative, um, or a season, and then they can let people go. So it gives them a lot of flexibility and efficiency in their business if they have a pool of independent workers that they can um, call on. And I think finally, independent workers can be uh, real contributors 
to a company's culture because independent contractors come in and they are efficient because they want to deliver the best results and deliverables and value that they can and then move on to something else. Like they're not sitting in an office having to fill a traditional work day. So I, they bring a level of efficiency and they bring a laser focus on deliverables and results that can be lacking in a traditional corporate environment where mm. process and bureaucracy and FaceTime and politics can take over. Yes. So it can be really healthy for a company culture to insert people like that onto a team. Yes, I was, I was gonna ask you, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of businesses will say, you know, but if, you know, if we're working with, with freelancers, or I've said it before when I'm talking to uh, architecture practices, you know, the benefits of using freelancers and, uh, and contractors, and often the rebuttal is always, you know, what about our company culture? You know, what, what, what companies can you think of have a really, have built and retained culture, business culture, through having independent workers? You know, I get this question almost every time I speak to a corporate audience, you know, what, especially from HR, you know, they're like, <laughs> well, what about our company culture? We can't build a culture if we have independent workers. And I just want to call BS on that. <laughs> my, my assertion here and now is that uh, having everybody together every day, full time in an office is not necessary, nor is it sufficient for building a healthy corporate culture. And I think everybody listening to this wow. can think about a place that they've worked, which is office based, which is made up of full time employees, in which there was a dysfunctional or toxic culture. They yeah. exist everywhere. So there's the evidence that having full-time employees in an office doesn't guarantee a strong corporate culture. I uh, worked for a number of years at McKinsey, which is a global management consulting firm. And in a firm like that, you know, consultants are largely on client sites. Teams are very fluid. They come together for client projects, bring on the expertise that's needed, and then the project is over, the team disbands, and then reforms onto different other projects. So it's an incredibly fluid working environment. People are almost, they're, they're remote almost 100% of the time. And yet McKinsey has one of the most high performing, uh, engaged workforces anywhere. And the, like just the engagement of their alumni, I think, speaks to the work culture that they've created. So I would, I would point to companies like that that have done an amazing job of having uh, non-office based, not necessarily full-time uh, you know, workforces and have managed to develop a healthy, functional, high-performing, highly engaged workforce. And, and what do you think that businesses need to, what kind of mindset shift do you think that the, the corporate structures, HR, the businesses need to make in order to cultivate a successful independent working culture? It can be a real mindset shift. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. A lot of uh, companies really do have cultures that are based on FaceTime, that are based on being in the office, showing up, putting in the hours that you know, require a fair amount of investment in office politics to get ahead or to get things done. This is the reality of corporate mm -hmm. life. And you know, so I think the shift in mindset for companies like that is first of all being, you know, kind of turning the mirror and saying, you know, what is our corporate culture? What is the behavior that we reward? How do people get ahead? You know, what are the kinds of demands and requirements that we put on our employees? Is it really based on results and deliverables? Is that how we reward people? Is that how people get ahead? Or is it based on other criteria like schmoozing with the boss or being in the office on the weekends or whatever it is or answering emails at 2 a.m.? Who knows? Yeah. Um, it can be really hard to change those kind of behaviors institutionally, particularly if 
uh, you know, the senior leadership team isn't on board. Like HR can't operate alone in a vacuum in those kinds of situations. Mm. But I think for companies that are able to, um, that, that already have a fairly healthy functional culture in place that, that is more focused on results um, and a sense of trust, a sense that they're hiring adults and those are adults that can manage their own work. Um, it, it can be very rewarding to move into creating a workforce that includes independent contractors. And I also think independent workers want to work for companies like that. They want to work for companies that will value the results that they deliver and that have a culture that rewards that. Yeah. It's, it seems that workers, people nowadays are demanding so much more or they want so much more from their lives um, and from their work, they want fulfilling work. They want to be able to have the freedom to be able to work in places that, where they want to be and spend more time with family. That not having that and kind of you know that is the the sort of constraint of working in a nine to five job is the you feel like you're in somebody else's structure, and it's, it can be very disempowering. That's completely true. I mean. I think people do want the ability to control their personal and professional lives and balance those in ways that make sense for whatever phase of life that they're in. But I also think, you know, workers are not finding the argument compelling that they have to be in an office every day. And I can tell you from the data, because I have looked, that there is not one study, not one that says that working eight hours a day in an office five days a week maximizes anything that any company or any worker cares about. It doesn't maximize happiness, satisfaction, engagement, productivity, cost efficiency, nothing, collaboration. It doesn't maximize anything. So I think workers are completely dialed into that and they're like, why do I have to go to an office? I mean, I can do as much or more and more efficiently and more productively if I'm sitting at home or in a co-working space and getting my work done and then moving on to live my life. Mm. Are there any downsides to contracting? Is it for everybody? Um, I mean, I like to think that, that everybody can do this. I will say that some people don't want to do this. It's not appealing to them. They, they don't want to take on, they don't want to run a small business. They don't want to take on you know, the, the back office, the marketing, the, you know, all the different things you have to do to run a successful business they're not interested in. They really would be much happier uh, working for somebody else, taking the risk of putting all of their eggs in one employer basket, and they feel very comfortable about that and fine with that. So some people just don't have the, the preference uh, for that. You know, I believe there, there are some skills that are required. You know, you have to be somewhat proactive and you have to have a sense of what you want. But I think a lot of the other, a lot of the skills that you need to successfully run yourself a, as a business, you can outsource or, or find help with. So I don't believe that's a, an enormous obstacle. Um, do, do you think there's a, a mindset shift that needs to happen as well with, um, with with workers, with employees about about money and about how money, the relationship that we have with where money comes from, how it's created. There's a big difference between the mindset of, you know, receiving a salary to then having multiple streams of income and to even, you know, starting to learn to leverage other people's talents in order to grow your income and then you know, into investments. Yes, it, and I, I devote a third of my book to financial issues because I do think it requires a huge shift in financial mindset. I mean, I can speak from the US where this idea of the traditional American dream, which I think is not that different from the traditional European <laughs> dream, right? Which is, you know, the house, the car, the vacation, the 2.2 kids, all of this is really built on the foundation of a steady paycheck because much of the American dream is acquired by debt and involves like fixed payments every month. You have to pay your mortgage, you have to pay for your car, you have to pay your credit card bills, right? So the whole thing is built on a foundation of a single job with a steady paycheck. So if you're interested in pursuing uh, you know, life as an independent worker, 
my suggestion is that you sort of step back and, and rethink your financial life from, from scratch. And, the, and that's like a big task for people, no question about it. Um, and, and I, you know, what I suggest is kind of a bottoms up approach. So you step back and say, what is the lifestyle that I really want? What really matters to me? You know, does it really matter to me to live in like a huge, beautiful house? And if it does, great, you know that. Uh, does it matter to me to have like a fantastic, like latest model car? Does it matter to me to be able to spend my summers, um, you know, on a beach somewhere? Does it matter to me to be at home every afternoon when my kids get home from school? Does it matter that I have flexibility to go visit my parents, you know, for uh, several weeks every year? Like really kind of thinking about like, what are my values and priorities? What really matters to me? And that it's hard work and it's reflective work, but that's the place to start. And it, it, it's challenging. It's a challenging exercise and I acknowledge that. But once you have that, you can then say, okay, well, now that I'm clear on what my values and priorities are in my life, what success looks like to me, then I can understand how much does the lifestyle that I want cost? And yeah. then you can understand, well, how much do I need to generate in my work life to cover the costs of that lifestyle? And then you can add on, okay, what kind of financial cushion do I want to, you know, savings, investments, you know, looking towards the future and things like that. But building it from the ground up is it, that's the strongest foundation that you can have for your financial life. I think what so many of us end up doing, and this is completely prevalent, is you know we sort of look around and go, okay, well, here's what life is supposed to look like. Here's what I should do. I should go to college. I should get a job. I should buy a house. I should get married. I should have two points. You know, and it like oh, you're off and running. And before yeah. you know it, you've built this lifestyle. You've built a life, and you've bought a life that you don't even want. And that's where a lot of my students that, you know, these, these, these are MBA students. They're in the mid twenties, all the way to their mid thirties. Some of them have families, houses, mortgages, and they come in and they do these exercises and they change their life. You know, they move cities, they sell their houses, they quit their jobs. They, they, they completely upend their lives. And you know, that's exciting. It's also challenging, but it ultimately, I think, gets them to a place where they are very clear on what they're doing and they're buying a lifestyle that they want. Yeah. Yeah. They're becoming the authors of their, you know, the designers, the designers of their lives. And how, I mean, uh, and I often think, you know, the, this kind of way of operating independent work for many people of the, you know, baby boomer generation, for example, like my, my parents' age, perhaps, this is so alien to them. How do we deal with that as like as, as generational friction? I completely agree with you. And, and this is an extremely common problem. The idea that for your parents, and especially if they're the ones that paid for your education, you know, they're like, wait a second, why aren't you getting a job with like a blue chip company? Isn't that, <laughs> that why I sent you to college or graduate school or whatever it is? Um, yeah, and, and, from, and from their perspective, it's almost like, why are you, are you becoming a bum? What's happening? <laughs> are you unemployed? Do you, are you not able to get a job? What's wrong with you? Um, I mean, I think it requires a lot of... Uh, communication and also a story you know there's a little bit of marketing involved here which is to really lay out what it is that you're trying to do and create a vision to help them understand what you're doing you know and talk about how the way you're working fits into what you want your life to look like mm -hmm. so coming right out and saying look you know living in the suburbs in a huge McMansion is not important to me. I want to, you know, I want to live in a city. I want to be able to like access things easily. I might not, I, I'm, I'm not even going to own a car. And, you know, I want to work in a way that allows me to have flexibility and to have security and here's how I'm going to save and here's how I'm going to like structure my life and just get them 
I don't know that you're going to get them totally comfortable. It's a huge shift mm. for somebody that grew up in a very different work world. Um, but I do think it's becoming more prevalent. More people are talking about it. There is a name for it. It is becoming a thing. And I think it's just helping them get up the learning curve and the education curve and just making sure you're addressing their concerns like, yes, I can afford an apartment. <laughs> you know, Yes, I can afford to save some money. I'm not unemployed. I'm not poor. You know, that goes a long way. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, I think parents just want their kids to be happy and to be able to live the lives they want to live. So if, if you can paint that kind of picture, I think that goes a long way. Brilliant. And what would you say is the future for our economy in terms of the way that people are working? Because you were talking that, that the gig economy is not the only way that can answer some of these questions of freedom and flexibility. What other sorts of modes or hybrid modes of working can you envision that, will be, that we're going to be seeing in the next few decades? Well, I think... I think what we're going to see is people will have very um, fluid careers. So I don't think that the idea of a full-time employee is going away at all. I mean, I think companies will always want full-time employees for critical functions, you know, to form like a core team to get things done. Some, a team with like institutional knowledge, embedded relationships, things like that. There are efficiencies that come with having employees. But I think what we'll see is a workforce where you might work full time for a period of time, particularly at the beginning of your career when you're gaining experience and building credibility. And then you might work for yourself or you might work, you know, uh, on a contracting basis for a former employer and then have a little portfolio on the side. And then you might go back. And I, I think what we're going to see more and more is uh, periods of time where people are reskilling as the job market changes. So taking time or, or maybe this becomes an ongoing activity where, you know, you're taking classes online or gaining certifications or constantly like building skills, continuing to learn or completely changing careers in, you know, two or three times over the course of your working life, which people are already doing. But I think we might see that in a much more, uh, acceptable, prevalent way where there's more infrastructure built up around it. Mm. And I think similarly, you know, for independent workers, like we've talked a number of times about you have to go out on your own and then build this kind of infrastructure around you to help build your company and build your business. I think we're going to see more and more opportunities from startup companies that are offering ways to make that super easy like oh you're going out independently like here's a whole bunch of things that you need to make that successful it's already designed it's already up and running it's already prepackaged. you just have to sign up yeah brilliant diane i think i think we've just about run out of time that's been absolutely fascinating and just a wealth of knowledge and uh, expertise there and really really inspiring just about how we can all become the authors of our own lives and how we can really create and design um, the direction of our careers. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I love the way that you have framed the message. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in my ideal, that's, that's exactly what the message that I want to send is that, um, you know, this is available really to anybody and maybe it takes two years of planning or three years or five years, but everybody can get there. And I, I, I love the idea that it's, you know, we're the authors of our own lives and, and what do we want to write? Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's been a really fun conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. 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 And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, don't forget to book your one-to-one -one breakthrough session with the Architects Marketing Institute. This could be one of the most important conversations that you have around your business this year. So follow the link in the information and grab that opportunity. And I look forward to hearing all about it. Views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.